Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, if I could just have your attention for a moment, uh, my name is Bob Steele, and I'm a board member with the Aspen Institute. And on behalf of all of the Aspen Institute, let me say welcome to you. Uh, this is the third year of arts programming that the Institute has done uh, here at Hunter and with Roosevelt House, at Roosevelt House with Hunter and featuring artists and policymakers, Renee Fleming, Yo-Yo Ma, Eric Fischel, Rocco Landisman, Howard Gardner, and Darren Walker. And in Aspen Institute style, our, our preference is to have a conversation where a good part of the time will be moderated and <clears throat> by people that think about these issues on an ongoing basis, but then we'll take a pause and a punctuation mark and we'll invite you to join the conversation too. It's part of the way we like to organize discussions and, and we think it has the potential to be uh, terribly productive and we're glad you're here to share it with us. Now I also have to say too, when I, I look to Jennifer just to say that uh, the Institute has collaborated with Hunter uh, over the last few years and you couldn't have a better partner, uh, someone who's thoughtful and creative and always uh, asking what they can do for the benefit of both organizations and she's just been a wonderful partner so it's great to be able to say that in front of our friends and to give you that recognition. Um, the <laughs> when the arts program began, again, I think we had an Aspen, Instant, Aspen Institute like lens on the issue of the arts and that was really to start to think about how in America can you improve access and inclusivity and what are really the ways we can think about that. And the idea isn't that arts are a separate thing that we should bring in uh, by invitation or on occasion, but really that's, a, that's the wrong lens. We need to think about a lens change and, and instead we should think about the idea that the arts are part of all that we do and that it should be inclusive in all kinds of things. And when we think through that, we kind of begin to think about participation being integral uh, to that idea and increasing access and availability. And it also rolls down to a word that we use a lot, which is citizenship, and the idea that Damien's developed, and it's become a word and a part of his, our vocabulary because of him, is citizen artist. And the idea that citizenship is really uh, more developed and more robust with a more participation. And so if you pull on that thread, uh, then you basically pull the arts uh, into participation, into society, into citizenship, all important words that form a narrative that we think will be part of today. Um, you know, from my perspective, as someone that works in government, I find these public policy questions interesting. And you know, things, thinking about things like access, as I've said, uh, what is the right way and, and what do we want people to do? Not everyone will be an artist, but everyone will be richer uh, for understanding about the arts. And how do you get that right? Uh, and recognizing the distinction uh, between those things. Also thinking and recognizing that everywhere we see, people use the arts as a way to catalyze ideas, movements, thoughts, and things like that. Uh, and we can all think of uh, groups that come together, plays, music and things that bring people together so that they put a point on the pencil in the ideas that are developing in their minds. And we know that arts are really important from that perspective. So I think really what Damien's tried to develop is how as, as leaders in the arts, and we've identified some like the panel tonight, uh, let's think about how to enable them and empower them to do that. So the plan, as I said, is for Damien to lead a conversation, and, and Damien will introduce the panel but I have the special privilege of introducing Damien. And so uh, let me just say that he's the director of our program of the arts at the Espen Institute. He also is the leader of the Harmon Eisner Artist in Residence program we run uh, annually. And he also has been a fantastic catalyzing leader for us with the arts at the Institute and just a personal privilege to be with and to be around. So Damien, let me turn it to you so you can introduce the panel. Thanks very much all of you for being here. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Bob. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction. And uh, I, I should say that uh, the ideal of how the arts can fit into society is not a new one. This is, you know, as old as time itself. I mean, you know, we uh, we examine these things with an eye to creating perfection. And as uh, Eric said earlier in a conversation with Hunter's students, it's asymptotic. It never quite gets there, but it's that ideal of perfection, which is an artistic habit. It's about you go back and you readdress. And that's many of these conversations have that, have that ideal. Uh, but with the idea that the arts are more simply than 
a decoration more simply than an enjoyment, but something that is essential and demands access and demands our attention. Uh, so that's the purpose of the ideal of citizenship. And I wanted to say that right off the battle. The idea of citizenship is not in terms of a paper, in terms of a, a country, in terms of anything except the idea of being a part of something and participating in it. Uh, and with a special reference to, to, to Bob, uh, last year when we had a discussion about citizen artists, he and I, uh, he said something that has stuck with me and I've repeated at every subsequent conversation I've had, so uh, it would be fitting if I, I did it, even if he's in the room, uh, which is that he said, the way you talk about this is the way we used to think about technology. That technology was something that was done, perhaps, you might engage with technology depending on what you did. But now in this day and age, if you're not actually engaging with technology, no matter what you're doing, it means you're not fully doing it. It means you actually are not actually doing your job, whatever it happens to be, because you're not integrating that asset. And he said, that's what you're talking about with the arts, and that's actually what I believe. So that's the idea. What is that citizenship? And in our democracy particularly, what is that that is required of all of us to, to be able to participate? What is that required of our government? Uh, and how can we be a more perfect union through that? Uh, so that's where this conversation comes from, uh, that, that search. And we're lucky to have with us today an uh, incredible group of people that we'll have a, a, a little conversation, and then we'll open up for questions. Uh, after that, to, so we hope you'll participate in the democratic and citizen and artistic sense <laughs> that we establish here. Uh, uh, on my right, of course, is uh, the great Kate, uh, Kate <laughs> Levin, who uh, has, simply by virtue of her presence and perseverance and leadership, made the arts something that this city has never actually seen. It is the principle uh, that, that Bob espoused. Where are the arts in everything uh, that she has done over the last years? Uh, part of the Bloomberg administration, Commissioner of Cultural Affairs. I think it's no accident. There's a number of arts organizations represented in this room today. Uh, and so we're welcome you, Kate, uh, to, to this conversation. Uh, I'll, I'll skip for a moment uh, to my friend Eric Liu over there, who uh, is a recent acquaintance. I met him with Howard Gardner, who I think uh, Bob mentioned was part of one of the many events we've done here. Uh, uh, and it's uh, an event about good work, about what it means to be good work, and we were lucky enough to sit next to each other the first night of this convening and immediately realized that there was an affinity. Uh, as he talked about, uh, I talked about the citizen as artist, and he talked about the artist as citizen, and we realized that we were grappling with the same issues. So uh, Eric comes from a background of many, many things, but including work in the Clinton White House as a speechwriter uh, and as deputy domestic policy advisor. Uh, he's also a violinist, uh, and he also had uh, gave us the, the great privilege of speaking to a group of Hunter students earlier, which is something that we do as part of this series, that uh, for every one of these convenings earlier, uh, one or all of the panelists participate in a, a discussion with uh, Hunter students who are invited so that they have a part of this as well. Uh, it was a remarkable convening, uh, and I have to say this is all due to the great uh, cooperation, suggestion, patronage, uh, and iron will to make Hunter a better place for that lady, <laughs> uh, Jennifer Rabb, who, uh, when I first had the privilege of working here, that was the first thing we decided, that that's what we would do. Uh, so I want to lead off with that, and I want to say one of her students said something great. Uh, they said a lot of great things, but there was one thing in particular. Uh, this young lady, uh, who I believe was a uh, poli-sci, math, econ uh, person, said, we have to be mindful of the accidental lessons we are leaving. And we all were struck by that thought in different ways. Uh, so I want to start with that, just that thought, with, with you, uh, President Rabb, Jennifer, with your students. You have made an effort over these last years to make sure there's arts across the curriculum, for instance. And you've you know, reached out to people like myself in the Institute to make sure that this goes on, and you use scholars. And I'm not, I, I don't think we should do a description of the programs, but what's the principle involved? Why? Well, one reason is that so many of our students are immigrants or first-generation college goers, and these are exactly the students that are getting messages from home, be an accountant, right? And, that, and, it's, and, and it's very valid because this is, you're going to college to get a job, and if we don't, in a way, fight back against that to say that a life well lived without, is not well lived without the arts, we have a role to really play in that. And I think in society now, we focus a lot in K through 12 and bringing arts into students that are not exposed to the arts. 
But it's at college where you be, you're really becoming a person. And it's that moment in which, yes, we're gonna create the, someone who will go on stage and maybe win a Tony Award. And then we'll create people who will work in the arts industries. But we're gonna create the audiences of the future. And without doing that, we're not gonna be able to perpetuate the arts. So it's an incredibly important mission, I think, for society, but also for us to give the imprimatur of importance to these students, that the arts are part of who you are, and you're gonna be a better accountant by understanding opera by being open-minded, by being broad. So it's an incredibly important mission, but it's not gonna happen by accident. Mm -hmm. Because I think any of us in academia, the arts can be marginalized. And if you think about right now, the scorecard that the um, Obama administration is speaking about, colleges are gonna be graded on the, the, how much money you make when you graduate. Well, that's a skew towards engineers, and God bless engineers. But um, that's not great for dancers, right? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, if, so as, as you may want to talk about. Um, but th so that's, I think, what for us, we, we have to fight against that to say the arts are incredibly important in making us great citizens, making us, as Steve Jobs would say, a better engineer, a better accountant. And college is the place to do it. Interesting. So, Eric, let me ask you then your reaction to that when we think about that, that moment in time when you have an op opportunity to participate. And we think about you know, education being a participatory activity. You can either learn it in a rote manner or you can learn it in a more enlightened manner that you, you grapple with it. And then with the idea of citizenship and participation, what's your reaction to the, the right in a way that uh, Jennifer's affirming to this? I, I really do, I'm, I'm struck by how you describe the, the mission of this place with so many of your students being first generation college goers and immigrants. And, you know, the work that I do, I run an organization called Citizen University, and we, we teach and we practice and we convene around the art and the meaning of citizenship, and all of that work boils down to this simple question, which is, what's an American? Right? What's an American? And I, I would say that th there is perhaps no more powerful way to get at that question, to peel it apart, to hold it, to behold all its facets, uh, than through art. Right? To be an American is to be able to hold many contradictory ideas together at the same time. To be an American is to be able to hold the difference between a stated creed or stated form and how it's actually played out in practice on the page or on the screen or in the community or whatever. To be an American is to be able to take stuff from all these diverse, disparate sources of inspiration and raw material and make something hybrid and new out of it. Right? All I'm describing is how to be an artist, and all I'm describing is how to be a citizen who thinks like an artist. And so uh, it's particularly for first generation either college goers or first generation Americans who are trying to make sense of this country, but also in the process of claiming this country, uh, that art ends up being, I think, one of the major ways to claim, right? To stake your claim and to say, I have a voice here. My voice may have an accent. My voice may not be fluent yet. My voice may not, I may not be able to say all the things about how society works, uh, but I'm gonna create something. And that thing might be music, it might be dance, it might be poetry, it might be a film, whatever it is. Uh, and I think that is the, the, ways, the, the way that art powers uh, citizenship. And you know, for me, it's certainly true on a campus, uh, but for us, we have to realize that uh, every place is a campus. And every one of us is either, is either advancing this practice of citizenship and art as citizenship and citizenship as art, or we're letting it recede. And the American way is not to let things recede like that. I love the idea, I mean, when you talked about the contradiction, being able to hold the you know, conflicting thoughts, I immediately thought of Whitman. Uh, you know, do I contradict myself? Well, yes, I do. And that, that is essentially uh, our chronicle of a whole period of time. Is, we contain is, is, multitudes. Is we contain multitudes within us. And that's about context. We talked about that a little bit earlier, about the context of everything that art can create. Uh, but you know, this is con easily, at this moment, I feel, go down the rabbit hole of, isn't art great? And I, that's not what this conversation's about. This conversation is actually about what is possible that art can contribute, or that, you know, that is in, in tandem with citizenship. It's about participation. Uh, and that requires that requires commitment, I often think. There's that moment of if you choose to participate or not, will you ask the question later, one of you, or will you wonder later if you did? Will you actually get into the swim of life in this country? Will you vote? Will you 
join the chorus? Will you find uh, uh, some common ground with your community and participate in it? And I always think that art has a particular way of doing that in artistic pursuits, but I would go to, to, to you, Kate, to talk a little bit about where you think arts and arts organizations are in that ecosystem of, of democracy and citizenship. And you know, uh, I, 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 would, I would give you as part B a little bit about those challenges of short-term and long-term thinking in that, mm -hmm. which uh, will take us down the rabbit The short-term would take us down the rabbit <laughs> hole of how will we get it done, mm -hmm. but the long-term is like, well, who are we and what kind of a student do we want to have and what kind of a community? It, it, it reminds me, I had a conversation with one of my favorite city lawyers, we were working on some major civic hairball recently, and he said, you know, the thing of it is everybody likes to think we're so logical. In fact, we're purely emotional creatures and we're constantly trying to paper that. And, you know, to me that's the, that's the core value that, you know, art is a fundamentally nonlinear system of expression and of ordering and subordinating experience. And, you know, to that extent, it in some ways speaks most viscerally to what it's like to try and get along in any kind of community. In, in New York City, where 40% of us were born outside the United States, and that statistic has been true for over 100 years, it is, you know, I, I know in many quarters assimilation is a bad word, but being able to represent in a positive sense the traditions of so many different societies and backgrounds in a productive way, again, it's an essential civilizing force. So having a recent count, we have about 1,200 nonprofit cultural organizations in this city, and they do represent pretty much every uh, kind of cultural diversity uh, that there is. Uh, they play an enormously valuable role in representing those kinds of traditions in a way that everyone can engage with. Um, so do they? Know, it's, I mean, how do they represent? Yeah. Yes. Do they? Do they? Is is it incumbent on them to to have a public voice in that way? Whether I mean, most most artists, most art, arts organizations don't get in the business thinking about it as a policy statement. You know, arts arts organizations are acts of passion. Someone feels really strongly about something and ultimately figures out how to build a set of practices around him or herself. Um, so, you know. Do they get into it for the civilizing influence? No, they get into it because they have something they absolutely have to try and communicate. And that's the, you know, I think that's where the tension comes in. That's, that's part of the sort of long-term, short-term issue also is, you know, how, how do you evolve as you're trying to make rent, fix the boiler, and do your thing into a small business or a larger business mm -hmm. that can see yourself as having commonality with other kinds of organizations, either in the cultural business or in your, in your community. I mean, it's uh, my colleague Rob Walsh, who runs the Department of Small Business Services in setting up the business improvement district system around the city, one of the big questions, those bids tend to be created through contributions of local businesses who want to amp up the kinds of services available <coughs> to them, and most nonprofits can't afford to pay into those kinds of uh, systems. But what's been great under Rob's leadership is I think he's made a forceful case to most bids that if there are active cultural nonprofits in their communities, they should be welcomed without the fee because of the extra added kind of value that they bring to those communities. Um, but again, it, it, it is institutionally a concern for organizations that often see themselves as very individual and unique to figure out how do you, you know, get into a larger... How do you join the Kiwanis Club? <laughs> and do know? we want to? And yeah. does, that, does that cut into it? I think that's interesting because that on the one hand, I often think that the whole point of art is to have a voice to some extent, to have an individual voice. If you, There's no point in some ways of, of just doing a nice performance. I mean, we all appreciate it, but what we really want is to be moved, torn by something that you know, uh, made given provoked by something that actually says something, or someone that says something individually, whether it's a, you know, a, a writer, a choreographer, a dancer, a singer, an actor, you know, whatever it is, that it has that voice. So we, we applaud that. And yet, we look at being a part of our time and the unique contributions that artists or arts organizations can make, and I often think, okay, there's a way for those two things to work in tandem. And how can we look to incentivize that? And that's what uh, I've spent a lot of time thinking about. That's what we talked about the first night we, we met, 
which was that, that prescription. So I'd like to, maybe I'll flip that actually and say, why don't we look at some prescriptions, if you would, for if our goal is to create a more perfect union with communities that are vibrant and uh, if we can agree, as I think we probably can, and uh, if not, I'll ask whoever doesn't agree to address that in a little while, uh, that, that art can play a role in that, uh, an important role, perhaps an essential role. What are those prescriptions that we can do to make that happen, to make it easier for, let's say, an artist or an arts organization or for a university, a college to, uh, I'll, I'll start with you, Jennifer. What do you need from your arts organizations? You have, believe it or not, there's quite a few out here who could maybe come up after and say, oh, I'll do that for you. But even before I get to that, I want to, because we're in Roosevelt House, I think yes. we should pay a little homage to a president who got it. I mean, you think about the WPA, not all, that every building should be beautiful, that art should be encompassed in architecture, mm -hmm. that this was a way to bring the economy back. Mm -hmm. What an incredible leadership role. And that they also supported arts work mm -hmm. from the government. So that's- Real jobs. The, real jobs and, yeah. and real beauty within functionality. I mean, the post office was the post office, but it was a beautiful post office, and that's one of the things the WPA stood for. Absolutely. So I actually think when people are here, we have a beautiful photography exhibit of some of the work done at the WPA that's just, it really is very yeah. emotional to think about that, a, you know, the leader of this country in a time of war and depression was thinking about art as an uplifting of the citizenry, and it wasn't just gonna build functional train stations, it was gonna build beautiful train stations. So that is a piece. Um, but I think that the, real, the answer is, of course, it's the, it's the partnerships, because as a public institution, uh, the good news for us is that the lights will go on. The other side of it is that half of them will flicker and the rest won't go, you know, will be very dim. So for us to do the things that we want to do for our population, we need the engagement, and so many people here have done it. We have, you know, s partnerships for internships and people and speakers, and just what you're doing through Aspen to expose our students to people like Eric, to people like you, that you, your passion for the arts legitimates their vision. And that's part of, again, the challenge as an in educational institution. We have one course that um, our, our honor students take called New York and the Arts, and they're required to take it, which is very interesting. Mm -hmm. So they're required to go to the opera, and they're required to go to the ballet, which doesn't sound like a burden unless you're pre-met, right? And you came in, <laughs> and again, I, you know, I, we met recently, I had a young Russian student who was incredible success, and she's the top of our pre-law program, and someone asked her, why did you become a lawyer? And she said, well, I'm Russian, and I'm afraid of blood, right? So, uh, so the other option was obviously to be a lawyer. So um, for students like that to be forced to go to the opera, and a lot of them, they're worried about their grades, and then time after time, the professor will say, at the end, something will hit, they'll be at the rooftop of the Met in the sculpture garden, and they'll look over and say to the professor, is that what you were talking about? You know, is that you know, the, the, the vision? So for us, we need the access to the arts, and we need the support of the arts institutions, and we need the models, the models of great artists who love what they're doing, are committed to it, and feel that this is a worthy life goal. To my mind, and this is something that came up earlier, what we're talking about is in some cases is simply arts organizations or artists individually finding the, the space to, to contribute in ways that I believe are completely reciprocal, uh, which is something I know that uh, Eric talks a lot about citizenship in general being a reciprocal activity. You get what you put into it. Uh, and that's, that's a huge part of what I believe as, a, as an artist one gets by participating in arts organizations as well. Uh, and it's not an either or, but rather a both and, that you can do those things. You can, you can walk and chew gum at the same time here and, and you know, go create great art and participate in your community and do all these things in meaningful ways that are for today. Uh, so I'm looking for a prescription still to some extent, but I guess you, you know, it's about the access and the, and the willingness and the, the partnership building. Because I think it's asking the, the organizations to take responsibility. And, mm -hmm. I, and I just want to stress that point again about, I think a lot of organizations are very focused on their K through 12 programs. I think if those of you on boards are engaged with organizations, think about it. That's probably mostly what you speak about. But I, I just, again, to emphasize mm -hmm. it, this is the time where citizens, you know, they're, this is the beginning, the end of really the maturation process. And this is what, <laughs> College is the time where the adult is really going to be formed and their habits are going to be formed. 
And if you don't invite us into your world and set those examples and make the tickets available and you know come and speak, we will be losing something important. So I think that's prescriptive in a sense. Look yeah. at look at what you're doing it in is. your arts yeah. organizations and make sure you're thinking about higher education because we often forget the importance of this time in people's lives and think that it's the colleges can take care of themselves. We need the support of partners. Absolutely. Eric, you got a prescription? You know, I, I'm so struck by <clears throat> what Jennifer is talking about with the WPA and the legacy of Roosevelt and everything that surrounds us. Uh, and it makes me think about how our context has changed, right? It, it's not just that politics is different, but our relationship to government is different, right? And uh, e even if um, uh, a, a modern president wanted uh, to direct that the federal <coughs> government infuse arts through all of its doings, that, that that work spread all around the country, we have a political culture today that makes that far less imaginable, right? And, and so for me, one of the things that I'm struck by is the, the prescription for, there's a prescription for us as citizens and there's a prescription for government. Uh, and the one for us as citizens uh, is to quote Bill Gates Sr. when he defines citizenship, it's about showing up for life. It's actually showing up and pressing the, the organizations and the artists and the power brokers that are in the ecosystem around you to actively think about how can art be more a part of what we're doing, right? That, that's our role kind of in a bottom up way. Uh, to make this a norm, uh, a, a norm of just what's expected in a healthy uh, community. From the, from the role of government side, though, I actually think we're in this really interesting, exciting time right now where, um, you know, the New Deal, even Great Society styles of top-down, more command and control approaches to how you govern and how you think about program, th th that age has receded. We are in a networked age, right? And when you think about what are some of the most interesting ways that creative artistic projects are getting funded today? It's through things like Kickstarter and USA Projects and, uh, and these platforms that didn't exist half a decade ago, right? Uh, and I think what government has to do is to think about how can government seed networks of giving, seed networks of creation? How can government be far more in the role of kind of venture capitalist, to put it that way, rather than direct operator uh, of arts programs, right? And I think there's a, um, th there, there's a lot of opportunity right now. And it's, uh, it, it's gonna require us as citizens, those of you who are involved in government, uh, and certainly those of you who are involved in arts organi organizations to not just fly on autopilot in the kind of the, the ways that we've been relating to each other up to this point. That's a, a, a hark back to the accidental lessons we leave when we think about you know, what what's our priorities are and we, we streamline them, we have to think maybe a little bit longer term sometimes. But that was a natural kick to you, Kate, about you know, government's role and that incentivizing. And I would say that perhaps on the national level things have changed a lot, but I would, I would say that this, in this city and in this administration, uh, under your leadership and that of the mayor and Patty Harris, uh, that the arts have been pushed in various ways with, with intention. Uh, and you know, looking at that legacy that you're, you're, you're leaving at the end of this term, do you feel that, uh, th what, what was missing? What would you hope for in, in terms of like, you know, what, what could be more? I mean, I think the, I mean, look, I'm from the government, even though I am here to help. So, you know, <laughs> there's a, um, and, and this country doesn't have a really good track record of government and the arts being, you know, all snuggly with each other. I think the, the, it is key to, I think, understand what government can and can't do. I mean, government responds to a lot of people running to one side of the boat. And the problem with artists and arts organizations is that they tend to see the world individually. Uh, you know, when, when you think about it, what an artist or an arts organization wants from the government is money and then to be left alone, not asked to meet any particular kind of deliverable or deadline. <laughs> um, and, you know, that's kind of not what government is really designed to do. Um, you know, the other thing is that government's in the business of delivering standardized services. We all want our garbage picked up, you know, to the same degree of frequency, and arts organizations tend to be valuable to the degree that they provide completely differentiated, unique, transformative, unquantifiable kinds of products. So there's, you know, again, I think there's a fundamental tension between the aims and ethos 
of artists and arts organizations and government. All that said, I think that because the practice of the arts is so fundamental to citizenship, there's also a huge set of opportunities that you need, need to evolve better language and a better opportunity to value. So, you know, what we've been able to do under Mayor Bloomberg's leadership and, you know, very much with Bob Steele's leadership, because the arts often fall in the world of economic development and because, again, you can't quantify the way big box stores can. You're often, you know, the dog tied to the roof of that car. Um, but, you know, trying to build a consensus that understands the specific kinds of value that art can provide. For example, in 2005, when the uh, city partnered with Christo and Jean-Claude to do the gates in Central Park, that brought uh, four million visitors in 16 days and $254 million to the city, which was you know pretty terrific in February. But more to the point, it was the first time the city of New York had been on the front page of every news outlet on the planet for something that didn't have anything to do with 9-11, that didn't have anything to do with politics or crime or ad hominem ideological attacks. And I think you know, history will show that that was a major pivot in positioning the city of New York as a place that was wonderful, that was open to different kinds of ideas, you know, that had a big healthy dose of whimsy, but also it gave people something to talk about. You know, I thought there were orange shower curtains. I thought they were kind of nice. I want a hot dog. Let's go get one. Um, you know, and, and, and it, in other words, it, it, it's understanding that the arts are not only valuable as a particular kind of disciplinary experience, but, you know, I try and talk about them. They're infrastructure plus. You get your bridges and your tunnels. What your arts organizations provide often is facilities, but they have this incredibly radiant uh, kind of impact on small businesses, you know, the bodega and the dry cleaner in the parking lot are more active. But, you know, when I travel around the city and talk to police captains, they love it that arts organizations are open late, because even if you don't go into them, they become a beacon of community presence. Um, so, you know, it, it's figuring out the value added. I mean, the other thing I'll try and say is, you know, any, any positive civic impact you want, arts is the second best way of getting it. If you want employment, again, bring in the big box store, but if you want long-term neighborhood revitalization, you know, the most exciting thing to happen in New York City, arguably, in the past 20 years is the emergence of Brooklyn as a place where lots of young people want to live. That's been done entirely on the backs of its association with the creative community. But that's a long-term play that, you know, the and city that, made this, that, this, this, this administration, but previous administrations as well. And that was a play, though? Or was that the natural bubbling up of <laughs> the artists had to move out of the city, out of Manhattan, because they couldn't afford it? I rent. think it was partly that. But if you look at what's really anchored that, it, I would argue that it is civic investment in institutions like the Brooklyn Academy of Music, which almost went broke in 1981. Um, it, the place was flooded and literally almost closed in 1976. I mean, it, it's pretty quick. Now, now we look at it as one of the most important performing arts organizations in the universe. And you know, when I first worked there after college, people said, what instrument do you play? It's an academy of music. So, um, you know, no one asks that anymore when you say band. But, the, you know, the Brooklyn Museum, which has the greatest demographic mix of, you know, diverse kinds of citizens going to see that work. Um, Brooklyn Botanic Garden. I mean, the, those three institutions are in the top 1% of employers in the borough of Brooklyn. And, you know, it radiates out from there. But you have to have your core stakeholders. It's no different than any other kind of economic development strategy. It just happens to be with arts organizations. Right. And there's that in interesting tension of individuality versus conformity and trying to fit into a, a, a movement that I think is a strength. I think that individuality is the common theme that binds those potentially common efforts. So I don't think they have to work against each other. No. I, I, think give, I think that. that you also deserve a lot of credit in the administration for the focusing on arts education, mm -hmm. which you know it's, it's never perfect, it's never enough, and there's always the stresses of both sides. But this was an administration that came in and created a cultural blueprint and said art should be back in the schools. And there are those of us who continue to push on that. But that's, again, saying that this is important mm -hmm. as part of your elementary, secondary education. And as you know, I, my friend Jody Arnold, who's here, is one of the leaders in training dance teachers. We're doing that now at Hunter. We're, create, we're training music teachers again. There were years we shut our music teacher program. We just stopped training music teachers because 
there were no jobs. And now we, we uh, graduate a number every year and they're immediately employed. So it's not perfect and I'm sure that there are people who say there should be more, but it's very important that the public schools are now under this administration hiring music and art and dance teachers. There's a, a big conversation, many conversations to be had on that. In fact, our friend Howard Gardner sat in this room talking about art in education as opposed to arts education and its role and that tension that, that we, we look at. But I would say that you know, many of the issues to do with that, but also to do with some of the problems that arts organizations face as citizens themselves within is has to do with measurement, about mm -hmm. trying to figure out what art's worth. What's it worth? What's it, what's it going to be you know, worth on the, on the scores or on the, on the economic chart or you know, all these things that perhaps guide decision making. Uh, and I, I just want to be sure, just I want to tag one thing you said that government's not in the business of doing what arts organizations would like, which is give me the, give me the check and don't call me until I'm done and hopefully <laughs> never just until right. the next check. <laughs> right. um, but, but I want to come back later on and find out what is government in the business of doing that that might actually be right, whether it's, uh, we talked about regulation mm -hmm. at one point and, and those kind of activities. But, but Eric, as far as that, you know, the idea of the measurement, you said earlier, need to overthrow the tyranny of the measurable. And I think that that's what art does. Art provides bigger context than measurement. When I think about something perfect, I think about a circle, or I think about a perfect note. And from there, I can extrapolate out to a symphony, or to a ballet, or to a great Beatles song, or you name it. You know, there is, you know, the, we all have our own tastes. But art gives that context of the perfect, which is indefinable, essentially. What is perfect? Uh, so, so Eric, in that, in that context of like trying to find that prescription, you know, how art can address everything from, from education but to inequality, perhaps, which I know is a particular passion that you look at citizenship as a, as a, as a prescription for inequality. Can you talk a little bit about that? that sure. I, I think there, there's so many interesting interconnected things. And you've used a word, Damien, <clears throat> a couple of times uh, tonight, ecosystem. right? I, I think it's really important in the first place for us to think ecosystemically about all of this. Uh, and, and you know, the, the question of uh, the role of um, leadership in, in cultivating uh, arts and, and creative communities, uh, whether it's a play or whether it bubbles up organically, uh, uh, you know, is actually, an, a, a, there's a very interesting case study in the country right now, uh, downtown Las Vegas. Anybody heard of the downtown uh, project? Yeah. So in, yeah. in downtown Vegas, uh, Tony Shea, who is the founder and CEO of Zappos, the online shoe and clothing company, uh, has decided to move his 1,400 employees to this, you know, neglected part of Vegas. Uh, uh, and put his employees there. They're actually in the old city hall building. Uh, and not just uh, bring the company there, but invest $350 million of his own money uh, into creating essentially from a civic desert, literally, right? Uh, an ecosystem of artists and uh, creative class types and all kinds of entrepreneurs and, uh, and tech folks. And it's, it's a living case study right now in whether it is possible uh, in a way where you take a relatively blank slate and from a leadership perspective decide here we shall have arts and creativity and community and citizenship, right? Uh, and I don't say that skeptically. I think there's something very interesting going on there. But I do think at the end of the day, what's going to make that work isn't Tony's 350 million. It isn't the first crop of either artists or entrepreneurs he brought in there. Uh, it's whether uh, over time, people who live in downtown Vegas start developing sideways, without regard to who's up above, sideways with one another, trust, norms of reciprocity, norms of we're in it together, kind of this desire to author and create and paint on a blank slate, on a blank canvas together, right? And right now, those norms don't really exist in that part of that town. But I think for us, you know, th this, this gets so fundamentally to the question of inequality. We are, we are living through right now the period of the most severe radical wealth and income inequality this country has seen since the eve of the Great Depression, right? And you could say to someone like me who works on citizenship stuff, why is that bothering you? you that's an economic issue, right? And to me, it is fundamentally a civic issue and an issue of creativity and arts because we have a promise in this country that whatever else is unequal about us, whatever ways we may differ, there is some notion of equality of citizenship. There's some notion that we, my vote counts as much as yours, my voice counts as much as yours, 
My ability to tell a story, to move people, to, to stir people to action is as great or potentially great as yours. Uh, and the fact of the matter is that this scale of inequality right now is making it challenging for us, in fact, to deliver on that promise of equal citizenship. Art is, in so many ways, an antidote to that. Art is, uh, I mean, in the ways that Kate is talking about, purely as a driver of economic development uh, and creating economic opportunity where it hadn't existed before. Uh, but it's also in the sense of it gives folks who are feeling increasingly disenfranchised, increasingly like they and their families and people who are like them don't have a place in the society, it is the way to actually express and to stake that claim that I do have a place in the society. And I'm going to write the poem, paint the painting, do the project, do the sculpture, whatever, that articulates that, that expresses that. Right? And I think that's the, the moment we're in right now. When, when you were, you know, when we were talking earlier about the tyranny of the measurable, um, look, I know that government, especially today in times of shrinking budgets, feels this pressure to be more businesslike and to think about accountability and deliverables. But you know, for those of you who are artists in this room or for those of you who are parts of arts organizations, we have to be part of a norm change that says, here is a realm exempt from the measures of the market. Here is a realm where we believe that art and creativity are not to be kind of measured in these ways that are familiar in business, but are meant to be valuable in their own right. And I think we've got to um, champion that in ways that are totally consistent with the kinds of activity and creativity and leadership that's been happening here in this city, uh, while at the same time making sure that uh, uh, we don't treat this as just looking for, um, uh, you know, adding up some of the parts and missing the whole. That's right. I mean, can mm -hmm. I build on that? Because Please. one, the issue of inequality, that's correct, but if the access to an arts education is inaccessible, then you go right back into that inequality. Yeah. And it goes, I guess, maybe into your prescription question. I would ask again that another way governments can support the arts in a more subtle way is the support of public higher education. I mean, at the moment, for a graduate student in our MFA programs, the tuition is $9,000 a year as compared to our neighbors uptown and downtown, bless them, and they're wonderful, but we're talking about $35,000, $45,000 a year. So I like to say you can get three MFAs at Hunter College for the price of one at Columbia. <laughs> and that happens to be true. And that actually attracts phenomenal faculty because they love our student base, they love the immigrant student, they love the sense of lack of entitlement. So people like Peter Carey are teaching for us and Colin McCann and Joaquin Pizarro. And that's an amazing thing that our students will get as good an education as you can get, as fine as education as you can get in any top school in this country, and they will leave as artists without debt. So it's hard enough to make it as an artist, mm -hmm. it's almost impossible to make it as an artist with debt. Right. So that's another piece of, of, of the sure. equality. Access, yep. of access the, is very important if the arts are gonna be an equalizer, you have to be able to get there. Yep, absolutely. The, the system that that, that implies, that, that, that Hunter has, is, you know, I'm, I'm very taken with this idea of trying to put something into the DNA, into the brew, that will create the five-year, 10-year, 15-year, 20-year difference that you can see. And when I think about that, when we talked with your students earlier, I told them that at the end, you know, every moment we have a choice about what we do with our time. Uh, whether you're an artist who, you know, for every three gigs you know, that you get paid nicely for, you do one benefit, or you make your deals with yourself about what you're gonna be when you grow up. Organizations are the same way, educational institutions are the same way, and it's perhaps nothing to do with uh, measurements. It has everything to do with philosophy to a, to a great degree about how, you know, what are those habits that we develop? What's the behavior? What, and you know, that's where I think about artistic habits, um, artistic habits about trying again, failing, finding ways to succeed where you failed before, never quite getting there, like I said, asymptotic, you, you, but you readdress your issue every time when you put your pen to paper or you, the way you look at something, which is a particularly artistic habit which you certainly can't measure. This has nothing to do with it. So it's a philosophical question. But, but why don't we flip that on to, back to the question, Kate, about what, what government can do because that's not, I mean, philosophically, I feel like th your administration did have a philosophy of that. I mean, of what can the arts do in any given circumstance? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the, the danger for me of some of this conversation is to give artists and arts organizations license to say, measurement in the marketplace doesn't work for me, so I'm not right. playing. 
that's really dangerous. Dangerous, And it, it's not just dangerous. I mean, so far we've been talking about artists and government. There's a huge private sector world out there as well that needs to be stakeholders and you know, needs to support uh, arts organizations. Um, and you know, I mean, the city of New York happens to be the number one arts funder in the United States. And you know, could we do more? Should we do more? Of course, but that's still like a lot. So um, you know, it's it, it, we. Part of the problem is we can't say what's enough because we don't know what it is that we're trying to achieve. Again, because of this tension between collective and individual. And again, government responds to the sector, not that it's not supposed to respond to one-offs, and my first case in Ed Koch's congressional office was trying to find someone's dentures that she'd left at the Port Authority bus terminal. So, you know, government needs to be responsive individually as well. But, you know, the... the did, did you? Hell no. <laughs> Two weeks later, they were not in the lost and found, but I really tried. You were there to help. <laughs> then I did figure out the social worker who could help her file for Medicaid to get new dentures, so it's like, yes. Um, but, but so, you know, what the, 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 the premise for public funding for the arts <clears throat> in the city of New York is public service. And you know that's a pretty clear rationale. That you, you can fulfill that rationale in lots of different ways, but we have to ask organizations to tell us how to account for the services that they are providing. And that doesn't mean that there isn't a lot of amazing art that happens that the public doesn't see. And it doesn't mean that those projects aren't worthy of support. It just means that the public sector is not the right funding partner for that. So, you know, again, government can do a lot. It's done a lot. You know, I have gambled $3 billion of your tax money over the past 12 years, and, you know, most of the bets are okay. But, uh, you know, that's th it has to be done on the premise of purchasing services for the public because that's what government is supposed to do. And you can't make an exception and say, I'm doing this because I like you mm -hmm. or because, you know, I believe um, in, in your crazy thing. I have to believe in your crazy thing, and ideally I like you or maybe I don't, but but it has, you, you have to show me how you are serving the public. So you have to come up with whatever, whatever measurement works for you. I mean, it's, so I guess that, that's what I would say, is it's not that you have to abandon metrics, it's that artists and organizations have to use their creativity and their capacity for storytelling and their incredible inventiveness with narrative to come up with different kinds of metrics. And would you say that that's an accepted wisdom, that that's what they should do? It, it, it's certainly what we at the Department of Cultural Affairs are constantly Same. asking our organizations to do. I mean, I, I, yeah. Ann Pasternak was here, Creative Time, the, the Key to the City, which is one of our favorite, um, I love all my children equally, but I still sometimes have favorites, um, <laughs> public art projects that are where you got a key in Times Square and you, it opened things, 24 different things all over the city. And in some cases, it was the first time that folks from outside of a, a, a particular neighborhood went to a particular place and, you know, used their key to get a free egg cream. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, a metric of success is literally that you are taking citizens and giving them an incentive to travel around their city in ways that, you know, no metro card on God's green earth could ever have done. Yeah, to I me, that's an incredible that. benchmark of Can success. Can you talk about that in terms of gardens of democracy for a second? Uh, sure. Um, so, so gardens of democracy is a, is a, a book that I've recently written uh, that makes an argument, well, the, the, the title is an argument. Uh, it says that so much of our, our civic and economic and, uh, and social lives we, in America, we often look through this particular lens uh, of a machine metaphor. We think about the economy as a big cogs and gears machine and engine, and we think about government and our relationship to government as that of a frustrated consumer standing in front of a vending machine that just ate your quarters. And uh, you know, we, we have all these mechanistic metaphors and mindsets, and there's some utility to that metaphor, but it blinds us profoundly to the ways in which actually a community, a neighborhood, a family, a country, an economy, these are gardens. They're not machines. They're not perfectly efficient, self-perpetuating, self-operating machines. They are gardens that require weeding and seeding and feeding and tending. They are ecosystems in the way that we've been talking about. And you know, the, I, I want to pick up on something Kate said at the, at the end there, which I, I, I find very exciting, actually, uh, which is this idea that artists uh, not only should be acceding to and, and uh, and meeting the measurement requirements that exist beforehand, but that artists should have a hand in reimagining measurement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's actually a pretty profound statement, and I, wouldn't, and, and I would say not just measurement as regards funding for the arts, no. right? I mean, there's the famous RFK quote about what does GDP measure, right? GDP counts 
all the guns and rifles we use to kill one another. It counts all the, po the, the automobiles and machines that pollute the air. It counts all of the negative externalities that we create, right? And we all roll that up into economic output, right? Uh, and that quote from, you know, 40 some years ago uh, leads us to a different sense of, are there different ways to measure what it means to be a healthy community? Are there different ways to measure progress, right? And in fact, there are all around the country now some interesting experiments, uh, progress index. The state of Maryland has come up with a different kind of measurement that's not pure um, uh, economic output, but it takes into account sustainability, creativity, uh, you know, health, and the education of the, uh, of the people. I would love for artists and people in the arts community to help us reimagine what it means in the first place to define and measure success. Like that, to me, would be one of the greatest acts of citizenship artists could do as a community uh, to get us just thinking, not just to define success in the ways that um, uh, we have in the past. We're, we're stuck in that, and we're going to go to questions right now, but it brought to my mind just quickly the, the conversation that we had earlier with the students, but about... <laughs> and flexible and appreciative with regard to cultural organizations. The problem when, when you think about plan in terms of government and the arts is it tends to iterate to we need five of this and four of that and you know 16 of something else. And instead what we find is that you have to let organizations be their own planners. Uh, it, it doesn't tend to work when government tells artists what to do. Uh, if you want to preserve real creativity, my, my new pet obsession is this economist Albert Hirschman who has this definition of creativity where he talks about you understand creativity only in response to things not going according to plan. Um, and you know that seems to me one of the extraordinary things about arts organizations is their resilience in the face of things not happening quite the way you thought they were going to happen. So my concern about government imposing a plan is that it would ultimately uh, be a kind of straitjacket and not allow arts organizations and artists to do what they do best, which is to continually come up with different kinds of responses to different kinds of situations. Another question? Well, I will pick it up then, but you can hold those and just say that the ideas of uh, participation in general, of how we can encourage participation or, or are intrinsic to creating community, I always think, you know, whether it's you know, a new neighborhood or, or, or how one does it. Can that not be a plan to, of encouraging participation, creating opportunities for participation in itself that, that is, uh, I don't want to say that's prescribed for arts organizations, but 
creating a new, I mean, I'd look at it as a new industry for arts organizations myself, being, going, coming out into the light to some extent, more than they used to. And some of it's about public spaces, we've talked about this. If you look at the new, the new spaces, Alice Tully Hall, that lobby is now, you wanna be there, signature theater, public theater. It's all about how we congregate and how we do things. Now that's, I don't know how natural that is or just response to need. I mean, can you, can you respond? Can you make I mean, the I need? Do you know what the need is? Again, in, if, if you're gonna be a successful applicant for public money from the city of New York, participation is essential. The, the, the tension to me comes from two places. One is how are we defining and understanding participation in a world in which uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art got 44 million hits, individual users to its website last year. That's an extraordinary form of participation. Are we understanding that? Are we capturing that? Are we thinking about the, the depth of what that actually means? Versus the fact that ultimately the job of artists is to do incredibly meaningful work and audiences don't often respond right away. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, ultimately butts and seats is not the most productive way of understanding the value of work. You know, if, if you go that route, you're gonna pick baseball over Merce Cunningham any day of the week. But I would argue that over the course of his career, Merce influenced everything from rock videos to leotard design to how we understand the human body moving in space. So the trick of participation, I think, is to figure out what it means most constructively. It has to mean access and literally, you know, barrier-free access. It has to mean diversity. It has to mean, you know, taking apart the kinds of, I think, unintended socioeconomic codes that organizations often put in place that end up inhibiting participation. Just very quickly, we, we the, um, Theater Development Fund did this fascinating piece of research a couple of years ago about barriers to purchasing tickets to theatrical presentations around Broadway. And among things that they found was that certain socioeconomic strata don't have credit cards, so they need to pay in cash. They need a point of purchase in their neighborhood where they can buy a ticket with actual money. Mm. Um, you know, huge difference. Second, for people who aren't used to going to performances, if, if, if you're benchmark is a movie theater where you have a ticket and you sit anywhere you want. To go to a theater where an usher takes your ticket, does something to it, gives it back to you, and you can only sit in a particular seat is, is different. It's not insuperable, but if you have no training for how to do that, it is potentially awkward and humiliating, and it becomes the gating experience to your cultural moment. So, you know, I think, in other words, there are all kinds of ways in which we want to preserve the awe that certain kinds of cultural experiences and cultural facilities have without crossing the line into being intimidating or exclusive. And that's one of the values, I think, of education. Yeah. Because when we, we so often will take a student to their first Broadway show. And one of my favorite experiences, I actually went with um, someone from the board to see Death of a Salesman, and we sat in the front row. And then, but she had bought 20 of our students not one born in America <laughs> to see the ultimate American play, Death of a Salesman. And they came, they sat in the back and they were crying, these kids. And to meet in the lobby and just bring those worlds together was incredibly beautiful. But that's what we were teaching. You go to the theater, you get there on time. You have to get there early. What's, you know, and again, how do you act? How do you You don't get talk on your phone during that time. And, it, and, you have to, yeah. and you have to set those examples. And if, this, if that's not happening in the home, for whether, whether it's cultural or it's financial, the school has to do it. What about setting norms of service? Now, I know their MFA program, whether it, uh, we talked about whether it's a requirement or not, but it seems to be baked in that there's some community service of sort within the universe, within the college. Uh, for an element of public service, of community service. Well, I think it's also now, a lot of our graduate students will be are teaching the undergraduate. Mm -hmm. So as they're learning, they're also becoming teachers, and they're dealing with their own, you know, confronting themselves as artists, but then artists as teachers and teaching others about the importance of art. Yeah. And that is just a, it, it's the value added is just immense. Another, so it's a really, it, really incredibly important, and. Also, many of the graduate programs will have access. We have a program where that brings in the top writers in the country for the graduate students, but we've now started to insist, or at least ask these artists to speak to larger undergraduate classes. So Margaret Atwood came to a 10-person writing seminar for graduate students and then taught a 
student undergraduate class. And that's an amazing experience. So sometimes you have to confront the artists mm -hmm. in their own honorariums and how large does that Absolutely. spread. Absolutely, we're baking and those systems. It. I mean, and I think you know, the, the one thing we haven't talked about is how this translates to power, actually. And that's something you've talked about. You know, participation in, is about, it's about power, exercising your voice. And I think that we miss that a lot if we don't take advantage of those opportunities. Um, and I, I can see that in the voting booth, certainly we can all see that. I think we don't see that sometimes you know, in short-term thinking, uh, certainly in arts organizations and certainly not in education in, in, a, in a large you know, scale right now. There's a movement away from that a little bit. Uh, do you want to comment on that? You know, Kate used the word earlier or, or talked about how the word assimilation maybe you know, has a negative uh, uh, vibe to it. And, and what you both were just talking about earlier, it, bringing these students to Death of a Salesman or learning the ritual of having a ticket punched and having an usher lead you to a seat, you, know, you don't have to call it assimilation, but it is acculturation. Right? It is getting acculturated to a set of norms that exist about how you behave in public, how we together behave in public, right? And um, I, I think there's tremendous, well, there's power in knowing how to do that. There's also an incredible feeling of, of disempowerment when you don't know how to do that or you don't feel like you know how to get your way in to the proper way to behave in a public setting like that. And, you know, I, I, I just fairly recently finished uh, a, a decade of service on the, I live in Seattle, uh, on the Seattle Public Library Board. And, uh, we went through this uh, period of expansion where we uh, renovated or created 27 branches, created our big new central library uh, downtown. And during this uh, period of, a, uh, of several years of fulfilling this bond measure, uh, we did this sort of hokey thing. Uh, we went around to every neighborhood in town and, and hosted what were called hopes and dreams meetings, right? Uh, which uh, is, you know, it's very Seattle. I don't know how that fly in New York, uh, but hopes and dreams <laughs> meetings. Uh, and we made affirmative efforts to reach out to lots and lots of communities and neighbors and people who live in these places who didn't know not only how to, the proper way to get your ticket punched, but who didn't know how to go to a public meeting, who didn't know when you're at a public meeting what the right order of things is to kind of express your voice, who didn't know whether when they were given a chance to literally draw like, what would you like to see you know, in this branch? What kinds of services, what kinds of art would you like? Who were tentative about whether you know, someone else should go first, whether someone who spoke the language better should go first, right? All these things. And uh, you know, Albert Hirschman, your, your current uh, obsession, you know, one of his great books is called Exit Voice Loyalty, right? These are essentially the three basic ways that citizens behave, and, the, and, and art teaches you each of these things, right? If something's not working for you, those are your choices. You can exit, you can express voice and try to change what's not working for you, or you can just stay loyal and, and, and keep on keeping on, right? Uh, and those of us who've had the benefit of growing up in this country and understanding how things, like we, we take for granted all of the stuff that so many of your students, it, 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 it's, it's brand new, you know? It's brand new trying to understand when it's appropriate to do exit, when it's appropriate to do voice, when it's appropriate to do loyalty. And uh, you know, just to bring it back to where we started, like these are the things that arts organizations and art experiences uh, and arts education uh, teach us. Uh, and you know, it's, a, it's, it's a secret sauce of democracy, I think. And I want to citizenship, just, yeah, too. And, and if yeah. I just add on that, to today we had convocation and our dean challenged the students to learn to ask a question and linked back as a political scientist as to some of our most critical problems because we didn't ask a question. We went into a war without asking a question. We drew a red line without asking a question. And what teaches us to question more than art? I mean, you're forced every time you confront a work of art, am mm -hmm. I understanding it? What does it mean? Do I, do I have the right meaning? And I thought that was such a great... Do connection. I even have the right to say it has a meaning, but, yeah, right? Sorry. So that whole idea that being able to question it is an absolute predicate to citizenship, and it's an and absolute uh, context of art. And the participatory quality of it is what it all hinges on. It's actually expressing voice, doing it. So we're going to close, uh, and we're happy to, to say hello and ask more private questions up here, uh, as opposed to in the, the larger frame. But I'm going to say, uh, you all received, as you walked in, uh, a Donors Choose gift card. Donors Choose is an opportunity for you to participate, uh, and in a very specific way. This is a gift uh, from the board of DonorsChoose.org, which funds projects for classroom teachers. The teachers themselves, 
go out and put online the project. And very specifically, a whole group of projects were isolated for us at the Aspen Institute by Charles Best, their founder, uh, for the Aspen Ideas Festival. And this term of using these cards is coming to an end. So we brought a whole bunch of them, so you should have all received one. And as Charles said, if you don't use it, it means you hate children. <laughs> <laughs> because this no is, pressure. it's paid for. It's done. And there is a project right now waiting for that $50 to finish getting those audio, that audio equipment so that they can actually learn to be sound engineers. Little sound engineers. Those, those easels, those you know, visits from teaching artists, they're just waiting there. So please, use that. It's going to expire. You must go and do it or you hate children. <laughs> and this is your chance to participate in these citizens. So thank you so much, thank Eric you. and Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you.